You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. The title of my message this morning is Created to Believe. You know, and there's so many things that people believe in. And some things are of great importance and some things are just, just because. So, for example, you know, for some, pers- some people it might be that a coffee a day is essential. It could be that I'm the best singer in after school care where I work. It might be that Geelong is the best place to live, or that footy is the greatest sport and Hawthorne's the greatest team, or that dogs are the best pets you can have, or that there's life on Mars, or that sugar is bad for you. There are so many things that you and I can believe in in this life. But you know, the most important thing is, is that we believe in Jesus Christ, our Saviour this morning. That's what we've been created for, to believe in Him, to have re- relationship with Him, to be reveal- have a knowledge and an understanding, be revealed of who He is in our hearts and our lives, to believe and know that He loves us, that He died for us and He rose again on the third day for us, and to believe and know that He is for us and not against us. These are the things that you and I can believe in and trust in and hold on to. You know, and I think one of the key ingredients in walking this Christian walk is obviously believing in Him and trusting in Him. And if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 22, verses 6 to 18, Genesis 22. It says, So Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here am I, here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abram went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abram called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not, have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is in the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of the enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice." And this first point I want to bring out is trusting in God. And I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story of Abraham. And the fact leading up to this, he and his wife Sarah had been wanting to have children but hadn't been out of heaven yet at this point. And in Genesis 15, 1 to 5, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, You have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to number them, and he said to to him, So shall your descendants be. So when Sarah and him were old, and she was well past the age of childbearing, they had a son that God had promised them. And then many years later, God comes to Abraham and says, I now want, to offer, I want you to offer your son, your only son, as a sacrifice to me. 
And I'm not sure what you'd be thinking at this point if God came and said that to you about your child. And I'm sure there are many thoughts that were going through Abraham's mind. Things like, but God, you've promised that I would have this child. You've given a covenant with me. You've said that the descendants I will not be out of count. They'll be too numerous. You said my, land, my descendants will have land. But also there could have been thoughts of, you know what, Lord God, no matter what, I still trust you. And I'm sure you have a plan in all this, even if I don't understand. And maybe you'll raise Isaac from the dead. There were so many things I'm sure that he was thinking of at that time. But despite all those thoughts that would have been crashing and going through his mind, he still obeyed God. He still just went and did the instructions that God had given him. God tested Abraham. But you know what? This morning, it wasn't so much of a test to produce faith. It was to a test to, pre- to reveal the faith that was already in Abraham. It was to reveal what was already in him, what God had already given him. You know, there are many things that you and I may go through and not necessarily all bad, but there's things that situations we may go through that we may not understand or have the answers for, but it doesn't matter because our God still has a plan and he wants to reveal things about himself and ourselves in those experiences, things that we may not have, other seen, may not have seen otherwise. You know, how would have Abraham known he was such a man of faith until he went through an experience that revealed what God already knew about him? How do you and I know this morning that we are more than conquerors? I know because experience has revealed it to me. How do I know this morning that if I lay hands on the sick, they shall recover because experience has revealed it to me? How do I know that you and I can get up and prophesy in the name of Jesus because experience has revealed it to us? How do I know that I am a mighty warrior in the hand of God because experience has told it to me? How do I know that I am a person that fully trusts trusts God and follows Him and has a different spirit because experience has revealed it to me this morning. Experience can reveal it to you this morning, who you are and what God has called you to be. It's because God already believed it. He still believes it today and He will believe it tomorrow because He wants to reveal those things to you and bring them out of you, what is already in you because Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm not negating what the Word of God says because we can use them in hand in hand. But what the Word of God says, then when we experience it, oh my goodness, it gives you that, such that revelation. I know who I am this morning in Christ because of all that He has done for us. For example, I run, don't laugh, it's actually true. Not very fast, but I do run. And there was a particular circuit that I was doing when I was uh, living with Laura. And it had a few hills, which actually felt like Mount Everest to me, and they looked like Mount Everest. But there was one particular hill that when I ran up up it, you know, I got to that point where I thought, um, I will eventually get over the top and be able to keep running. And then when the day that I did, I was so proud of the fact that, oh my goodness, I made it up this hill. Not only that, I kept going and didn't, and didn't stop running. But then the next time I went to do it, I thought, you know what, I could actually allow excuses to come into my mind now. Oh, I'm a bit tired or it's a bit hot. Oh, can I really do it? But you know what? Experience had already told me that I can do it. Experience had already told me that I could do it. And I could give myself excuses, but the reality is I already knew that I had done that and I just had to get up and do it. And that's the same with us with the Word of God and what God wants to bring out in our lives as we trust Him this morning. And I know we all do, but as we trust Him, He wants to bring those things out in us so that we can see who we are in Christ, because Christ in us, the hope of glory. So here is Abraham trusting God, even though the instructions seemed to contradict what God had promised him. God had already promised, in Isaac, your seed shall be called in Genesis 21, 12. It seemed unusual to kill the son who had been promised to carry on the covenant when it had not yet been fulfilled in him. It was like God was asking him to kill the very promise that he had given him. But Abraham had to learn the difference between the promise, trusting the promise and the trusting the promise giver. We can, you know, many times, I'm sure we've all done it, but it can sometimes trust the promise more than we trust God. And, you know, sometimes we can feel that it's our responsibility to kind of help him on the way or go out and do it for ourselves. And sometimes that could lead to disobedience as Abraham did experience. But you know what? 
we need to trust the promise giver this morning, our God. And you know what? He will look after the promise for us and bring it back to pass when He needs to. We need to trust the healer this morning more than the healer, healing. We need to trust the deliverer this morning more than the deliverance. Why? Because this morning He is God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He knows what He's doing. He has a plan for your life. And we can trust Him this morning with our hearts, knowing that He will do what He's called us to do. Abraham trusted God even when he didn't understand all that was going on. You know, the good thing with this story is that Abraham didn't seem to argue with God. It wasn't like he went to other people and said, oh, what do you think about this? What's your opinion on this matter? He didn't delay. He got up the next morning and just went and followed God's instructions straight away. He didn't um, delay what God had asked him to do. And uh, because of that, You know, he did what God had asked him and he didn't consult his feelings. And you know what? I'm sure he would have had many thoughts and feelings going through his mind, but he didn't allow that to dictate to him to following God's instructions. He trusted God and he went. And you know what? The journey that he took showed that he trusted God because it was three days until he got to the place where he was asked to sacrifice Isaac. That's three days of walking, three days of being a father, knowing what God has asked you to do. Three days of that weighing heavily on your mind, but he still went and did what God had asked him to do. His speech showed that he trusted in God. He said, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you, he said to his servant. He carried out God's instructions, even with the raising of the knife over Isaac on the altar. And then, and then God speaks and says, Abraham, Abraham. Was he afraid that Abraham wouldn't hear him the first time? No, because it was covenant talk. It wasn't repetitive or repetition. It was an echo. Abraham, Abraham, once we were spoken, twice have I heard it. Power belongs to God. He calls you from heaven and it echoes in the heavenly, in the earthly realm. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Joshua, Joshua, I have called you. Samuel, Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant listens and hears. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, it's not God just repeating Himself. It is an echo from heaven. Once have I spoken, twice have you heard it, because it is covenant talk. It is establishing with you the relationship that He has with you. It's a covenant relationship. What did we hear about in communion? It is a covenant relationship this morning that each one of us walks in daily because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. You may not hear your name, Rachel, Rachel. You may not hear your name, Phil, Phil. You may not hear your name, Joe, Joe. You may not hear your name, but it is said twice, but it doesn't matter because of the covenant relationship that we have with our Lord and Saviour. And He says it to us over and over again through His Word. We hear it over and over again at church. We have a covenant relationship with our God this morning. Once have I heard it, twice. Once was it spoken, twice have I heard it. Abraham, Abraham. You could imagine that noise just coming up and him stopping what he was about to do because of covenant relationship. He is a good God. He is a powerful God and His covenant is forever. It cannot be made void. It cannot be nullified. You and I can never do anything that can take us away from God's covenant for our hearts and our lives because He is a good God and He has established it with us through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us this morning. Once was it spoken, twice have I heard it, echoed in the earthly realm. Your will will be done on earth as it is already established in heaven. Abraham, Abraham. Whenever you hear that, it is indicative of the covenant relationship he has established with you and I this morning. And God was re-emphasising the covenant that he already had with Abraham. My will will be done. Thy word, O Lord, is forever. 
And in verse 17, it says, Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. You know, this morning we've been created to believe and we've been created to trust God. Number two, we're created to believe in God's mighty word this morning. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 9 to 10, it says, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ohophite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned to him uh, after him only to plunder. And what did Eliezer have? He had a sufficient weapon. He had his sword, a sword that he was confident in. It was a sword that he had used before in battle. It was a sword that he would have practiced with. He knew the weight of it. He knew the feel of it. He knew what he had to do to thrust through things. He knew how to use it defensively. He knew how to use that sword. He knew how to clean it. He knew he had to sharpen it. He could rely emphatically on his sword to do the job of defeating the enemies. And he had confidence in his sword. You know, I'm sure before he went into battle, he would have practiced for hours and hours, knowing what he could do with the sword so that he could defeat the enemy. And it became like an extension of his arm. And for us, it is like the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. In Ephesians 6.17, it says, We are told to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You and I this morning can have confidence in the Word of God. You and I can know it so well. You and I can know that the Word of God will never fail us. And we can have confidence to know that it is reliable when we use and read the Word of God. We can practice using it, become familiar with with what God has given us and what he says about us. What did Pastor Phil say last week about this? Don't let go of God's word. Don't let go of God's word. God doesn't lie so we can be assured of every written word that he has written down. We can take him at his word every day. Isn't that exciting to know this morning that we can take him at his word? In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And once you've experienced this for yourself, you can be convinced of that, that God will say what God says he will do and that his word is true, that he's always faithful to his word and we can take him at his word and we can have absolute confidence in the weapon he has given us. This morning, you and I can have absolute confidence in the weapon that he has given us. We can practice with it. We can use it daily during our walks with God. We can do whatever we can with the word of God because we can have absolute confidence because it is so reliable. You know, I can say to myself that God is a good God because that's the, what the word of God says. But not only that, I have experienced that in my own life. So it just in emphasises the truth that God is a good God. Not only does the word of God say it, but I have experienced it and I know it to be true. When his word says he hasn't given me a spirit of fear, I can declare that God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. And then I can experience his peace that surpasses all understanding because his word says it and I can declare it over my life. When his word tells me not to be anxious about anything and that I know that I can cast my cares onto him, I know that I can get that calm that comes only from his presence and from him because the word of God says it. It is reliable. It is something that I can trust in, that I can hold on to and I can use against the enemy that I can use against my own mind that sometimes comes in to distract me because the Word of God is so reliable for our hearts and our lives today. And his hand stuck to the sword. And you know what? We need to stick to the Word of God this morning. We need to cling to it. We need to read it. We need to meditate on it and we need to saturate ourselves in it. You know, I heard, read this example a couple of weeks ago of someone saying, but you know what, it's really hard to meditate on the Word of God. And the person's response was, no, it's not. 
We spend so much time in our daily life worrying about things that are going on around us that our mind just goes chicka 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 over this thought. And you know, you'd be thinking about something and it just goes on and on and on. And we can begin to overthink a situation. And something that can, um, we can just dwell on things that are really of no importance to our life. But that's the same as meditating on the Word of God. It's just thinking of that thought over and over and over again. That scripture over and over and over again. Your peace surpasses all understanding. I can cast all my cares on you. You haven't given me a spirit of fear. I am more than a conqueror. And you can begin to dwell on those thoughts over and over and over and over again. So that it becomes a reality in your life of who you are and what God is in your life. So we can do it on a, in an earthly sense with our own mind. We just need to take the scriptures and do the same thing. Just repeat it over and over in our mind. And you know what it, when it's like when you read the Bible in your daily devotions and you see something you go, and it really triggers something can you? That's the time to go, okay, I'm going to replay that scripture over and over in my mind when I'm driving to work, whatever I'm doing, picking up the kids, whatever it may be. You can repeat that scripture over and over in your mind and meditate on it and meditate on God's goodness in your heart and your life. Because this morning we are created to believe in God's work, uh, word. And his work, but his word. And number three, believing in the promise. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 11 to 12, it says, And after him was Shammah, the son of Ag the Harite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. Then the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it and killed the Philistines. And the Lord brought a great victory. And as we see with this story, Shammai stood in the, middle of the, in the middle of the field of beans. He didn't stand on the edge. He didn't stand outside of the field, but he stood right in the middle of the field because that's where God wanted him to be so that he could see the victory that day. We too this morning can stand our ground as we believe the promises that God has given us, what he says about us, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made this morning, that we are the apple of his eye, that we are his children, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, we walk in victory. We can stand right in the middle of that field, so to speak, or right in the middle of where God wants us to be and declare who we are and to believe what God has said about us and his promises that he has over our hearts and our lives you know he defended that patch of ground and wouldn't go without a fight he was not going to allow the enemy to drive him out of that of that field you know the Philistines army saw that field and saw you know look what this is a field of beans and this is easy for us to take and we don't have to put any work put any work into it we can just go and take it um, and one of the reasons that he was so adamant of defending this ground was because it was food for the people in the area but you and I too this morning can defend what God has given us the promises that he has given us and not allow the enemy to drive us out of where he's positioned us so that we can see all that God has for us and lastly he was standing on covenant property in Genesis 13 14 15 it says and the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Shema was going to defend this field of beans because he believed in the promise from the Lord that this land was covenant property that he was standing on his covenant rights and defending what rightfully belonged to him and the children of Israel. It wasn't just any old patch of lentils, as some may have seen it. It wasn't insignificant. It was significant because of what God had established with his people. The enemy may have seen it as insignificant and an easy victory, but God didn't see it as in insignificant and he knew it would be a great victory. The land was promised to Abraham through a covenant between him and God. It was ratified to Moses, making it officially valid and established by Joshua when he entered the promised land, created to believe in his promises this morning. He is a good God who has so much in store for each one of us and this church. And this morning we can stand on our covenant rights, knowing who we are in Christ and believing all that he has for us, believing what he says about us, believing in his word and believing in the promises that he has given to us personally and what we can read in his word this morning. And I just want everyone to stand in his presence.